Hi, I'm Harry Rock, and welcome to another exciting edition of the Westfield Council on Aging Presents. This is a special collaborative between Tina Gorman, the executive director of the Westfield Senior Center, and Pete Coles, who is the producer of WCPC Westfield Cable Channel 15. Behind the cameras today with us is Ken Stomsky, who's our associate producer. And we are excited to be here in Springfield. You'll notice that our background is a little different than what you normally see when we're at Studio 120 in Westfield at the Westfield Technical Academy. But our topic today is Valley Eye Radio. And my guest is Harold Anderson, who's the program director of Valley Eye Radio. They're located in their new studios. <laughs> And we we're excited to be here at 1 Federal Street, Building 101 in the STCC Park off State Street in Springfield. So, Harold, it's, we really appreciate you taking the time. I, I find it really almost comical that I think it was two, maybe three years ago that you interviewed me when I was the head of the Westfield 350 celebration Correct. for our big 350th Correct. celebration, and you were interviewing me here in Springfield yeah. to uh, bring news of that to our community, and here I am interviewing you <laughs> going full circle. Yeah, so. I feel like I should be doing an introduction or something. Oh, oh, Harry, how are you? I know it. So, you know, I always like to get started uh, just to let our viewers know as far as, because they don't know who you are and uh, where you've come from, but where'd you grow up and where'd you go to school and how'd you get involved in radio? Well, I am a lifelong resident here of the Pioneer Valley. I was born in Springfield. Oh, okay. Uh, my parents, actually, they came from elsewhere. My father came from Illinois, and my mother came from Spain. Wow. And they, uh, they met here. Actually, my father came here because his brother, who happens to be my uncle, of course, was mayor of Springfield at the time. Who was that? Albin Anderson, oh, back gosh. in the 1940s. Wow. So he was looking for a job, and he thought he'd come over here. And he decided that he was going to try to find a job, see if that works. And uh, then he decided to go back to school to kind of redo things. And while he was at school, he decided to join a pen pal kind of a situation. Well, at the time, my mother, who was in Spain, I said, she was working for an electronics firm. And she was told by her boss to learn English. Okay. So her brother thought that it would be a great thing if she got a pen pal. <laughs> so to make a long story short, uh, they met. And so we stayed in Springfield, and I was born in Springfield. And uh, went to local schools and uh, went to high school at Cathedral High School. Oh, wow. Sure. And then afterwards, I took a bit of a hiatus, if you will. I was at uh, West New England College at the time. Mm -hmm. Really not quite sure exactly what it was that I wanted to do. And there was a, uh, another student in my class who was doing some temporary work for WHYN. She was taking phone surveys and screening calls for their talk shows. And she was going away at the time, and she told me about it. And I said, well, that sounds like something kind of interesting. So this was in the early 80s, and I decided to go over there. And I got the job, and one thing led to another. And you know, radio, as you know, in this kind of a business, at least commercial radio, it's hard to really make a career out of it. So I got into other things along the way, but I always kept my hand into radio to some extent, more mm -hmm. or less. And then um, things happened at home, and I had to kind of take care of things at home. So I was out of work there for a while. And then as I was getting back into the work world, I saw a posting for a fill-in position at Valley Eye Radio. Hmm. Actually, it was Valley Radio Reading Service at the time. Okay. And I decided to apply because I, I always enjoyed radio. It was always fun. So I applied, and I started working just one day a week, filling in for our executive director, Barbara. And then uh, over time, things began to increase. I started picking up more time, and then we started to go out into the community and do interviews and do recordings. Mm. And one thing led to another, where eventually I became the programming coordinator. So now I handle the programming. I handle the volunteers. We have close, a little over 100 volunteers, actually, that uh, help us out. And they are really what make this work, because without them, there would be no need for somebody like me, that's for sure. So, <laughs> and they are very dedicated, and I can't say enough about our volunteers. Right. They're very helpful. So your title is Program Coordinator? Program co Programming Coordinator, yes. Okay. All right. That's great. And are you, so are you full-time or still part-time? Full-time. Oh, you are full-time full -time. now. 
So how about that, that what is your passion and uh, it was really able to develop into something that was really strictly very part-time initially into a full-time gig Exactly, for you. yeah. Thank God it really worked out very well. Yeah. And, of course, we're enjoying being in these new studios. Yes, are we? <laughs> uh, and you just moved in here when? Basically, we first moved out back in just before Thanksgiving of 2020. Okay, and moved out of where? Out of, we were in, located in the basement of the WGBY building on 44 Hamden Street in Springfield. Okay. And so we moved out, but there was some delay in getting everything ready. So we were running under full remote mode for at least a couple weeks. And I was at home which was great because you know, <laughs> the commute was very short yeah. and uh, I didn't have to worry about forgetting my lunch. And, Absolutely. It uh, worked out very well. But again, thanks to our volunteers who, especially when COVID hit, uh, many of them are now broadcasting from home. So as you can see, when you came in, there really wasn't right. anybody here. Yeah, it was just to speak you. Of. Very few people actually come to the studio anymore for a lot of mm -hmm. good reasons. But a lot of readers have decided to do their work at home as well, too. And one thing, again, I say thank God, was the COVID thing really hit in our area in about mid-March. January of 2020, Barbara suggested that I'd always been mentioning how we needed volunteers, how we said how we could do more programming, how we could do more if we had more volunteers. So she suggested that I send out a press release to the various publications letting them know we were looking for volunteers, telling them about ourselves, getting the word out, and seeing if we could get some volunteers. The response was unbelievable. Really? We went from about 40 or so volunteers up to about 90-something volunteers. Wow. And so but in January, February, March, we were getting all these new volunteers in, and we were putting them in the studios and getting them set up. Some were already working from home. And then when March 15 kind of shut a lot of things down, a lot of our readers, for very logical reasons, decided to stay home. It was safer for them to mm -hmm. not come into the studio. Sure. So we had to shift over to mostly remote mode. So we got a lot of people set up, and many of our readers, some of the existing readers, made the transition over to remote reading. A lot of the newer readers were already into the whole routine. And we were able to continue our programming. In fact, not only did we continue our programming, but we expanded our programming. Hmm. Because beforehand, we were fairly limited in what we could do for like Franklin, Hampshire counties, even for Westfield. Hmm. We were fairly limited. And that was one of the reasons I kept saying, if only we had more volunteers, we okay. could do much more. Right. But we only had so much. So now that we have the volunteers, We've expanded tremendously. We were able to do Westfield News. Before, we were doing it like once a week, just a little roundup. Mm -hmm. Now we're doing it six days a week. Mm -hmm. And we're doing the same for the Daily Hampshire Gazette, the Greenfield Recorder, Springfield Republican. We do that seven days a week. And we can do that now thanks to all the readers that we get. Yeah, I was on your website last night prepping for this. And uh, good, a very informative website, by the way. Mm -hmm. you got a lot of information there, so I was kind of working my way through. That's another tabs. thing that came in fairly new. The, the previous website, if I may, was this one page. I have no idea how old it was that it was created. Right. And I used to have as a, a running joke that if I would mention to someone, it says, oh, have you seen our website? And if they said yes, I said, I feel very sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel sorry for them anymore. Right. But it, there, there's an amazing amount of information there. Mm -hmm. But I was on the programming page, yep. and I was actually impressed with how much programming you've got yep. going on. Yep. And to your point, there's morning programming that gets repeated in the afternoon, the evening, and stuff. And um, just for our listeners, can you give the web address that they should type in to get to your website? Certainly. It's www.valleyiradio.org, and that's all one word without any spaces, V A L L E Y. E Y E R A D I O dot org. Right. So I would definitely encourage our listeners out in Westfield, if you're looking to get involved, get to their website. There's an awful lot of information, and 
you can definitely get a feel for what they provide for services and then what you can take advantage of. So let's talk a little bit about the organization. Uh, first of all, yeah. how, how long in total have you actually been with Valley Eye Radio? If you look back to when you first got started as a one-day volunteer. It will be probably, I believe, six years this summer. Wow, okay. Time flies. Time does <laughs> and fly. And I have been it's... having fun. Yeah, that's important, as long as you enjoy what you're doing. So let's talk about the organization. As I understand, Valley Eye Radio is a 501c3 nonprofit that organization. That is correct. Is that correct? That is correct. didn't start out that way. It started out back in 1979, just a few people getting together, realizing that the idea of accessible programming was something that was very important because our main focus is providing accessible readings from newspapers, publications, generally geared towards those who are blind, visually impaired, those that have some other kind of health condition or disability that makes it difficult for them to independently process print information for themselves. Mm -hmm. Somebody might have Parkinson's or brain trauma or just uh, heart arthritis or something. They just can't hold a newspaper anymore. That tends to lead to isolation. People who have disabilities tend to focus on what they can't do. Yeah. And they don't feel part of their community anymore, and they can't read the newspaper anymore. They can't follow the information that they used to do, and they all this talk about, oh, I used to be able to do this. I used to be able to follow this. It really wears on somebody, and we want to fight that. We want to combat that. So by our programming, we have all these volunteers who are reading articles from the various publications to broadcast to our listeners so that they can keep up to date on what's going on. Mm. and what's going on in their communities and so they can feel part of, of what's happening. We try to give them practical information. We try to give them even though something a little light because the news, as we all know <laughs> from the last year, can get a little <laughs> heavy. It can. But lighten it up every once in a while with uh, levity, uh, some kind of programming like that. So let's take, uh, that's an interesting question because I, I was reading all this and, you know, it, it was interesting to me that while your name is Valley Eye Radio, you're not a radio station per se. Yeah, I'd like to say that we're a radio station you can't hear on the radio. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and everybody looks at me like, what? Uh, I've had it asked me many times, what's your call letters? We don't have any. We don't have a tower. We don't broadcast. So how are people listening to your program? Traditionally, the way that people would listen to our program is that we broadcast piggybacking off of some existing radio stations. Okay. So there's WFCR 88.5, the WTCC 90.3, there's uh, WHAI 88.3. They, if you were to listen to them on your traditional radio, what you're listening to is their main signal. What you're not hearing are these frequencies just off the main signal, which we call sidebands. But the FCC allows them to give nonprofits like ourselves access to those sidebands to carry our programming. Hmm. Again, you can't hear it on a traditional radio. But what we do is we have someone create radios for us that are specifically tuned to that sideband frequency so that all somebody has to do is turn the radio on and they would listen to Valley Eye Radio. So are they actually picking up the radio frequency? The sideband frequency, correct. It wow. is specifically tuned to that sideband frequency wow. so that they can listen to Valley Eye Radio uh, at that time. That was a traditional way of doing it. The problem is, as many people know, and especially many people in Westfield know, there are places where the radio reception is not exactly that good. It is an FM signal, so it is line of sight, which means that from the tower directly to the person. So if there is a hill or there is a large building or you're in a large complex, and especially if you're talking about our target audience, many of them can be located in assisted living facilities or they can be located in large buildings, which is great if you're on, say, the north side of the building and the signal's coming from the north, but your friend who needs our signal is off on the south side of the building. Mm -hmm. uh, the signal's not getting through the building very well. So there were areas in which we would have difficulty providing service for someone. So when someone would call requesting a radio, we have a, a gentleman, uh, Dick Hurdle, who does some analysis for us, computer analysis, very detailed. And he'll be able to determine for anyone's given location the strength of the signal there. 
So we'll determine which signal is best for them and if it's a strong enough signal. If it is, then we have the radios here that we can provide them to listen to Valley Eye Radio. Now, all the radios are programmed to different frequencies, or can you program any frequency into any radio? It's a one-trick pony. Okay. It's only set to that particular frequency for Valley Eye Radio. So if someone lives in Springfield or Westfield, let's say, and they're able to listen to Valley Eye Radio with the radio and they move to Greenfield, it's not going to work. They would have to get a new radio if they were going to do that. I see. Got it. Great. So, But that presented a lot of a problems. As I would mentioned to you, especially with Westfield, true story, because part of my duties is also handling the new radios. If someone calls up look, requesting a radio for our service, generally they're dealing with me. And when anyone would call from the Westfield area and they would say that they were looking for a radio, I immediately went into my what are we going to try if this doesn't work speech? <laughs> because I knew that the track record of Westfield in most of the areas that we had dealt with wasn't very good as mm. far as getting our service. So that was always a bit of a problem, a limitation, if you will, and mm -hmm. being able to serve. Because we knew the people were out there. We knew we could serve these people. I had a couple people on my list that were from Westfield, and I had to put a little X down. Sorry, oh, wow. we can't provide you with service. Wow. Uh, but since then, we've been looking into other ways of distributing our program, one of which is through some cable access stations. And we're very proud to say that Westfield Cable Access is one of those stations that carries Valley Eye Radio. On their community bulletin board, you're, anyone with proper vision or vision can see the community bulletin board, but what you're listening to is Valley Eye Radio. Mm. And as soon as that happened, I got to my list, and I looked up those people that I had X'd off from Westfield, and I <laughs> called them up, and I said, guess what? You can listen to us now. Right. So it was very helpful. And since then, we've also expanded assisted living facilities. I mentioned how that was difficult, getting our signal into them as well, too. Uh, Glen Meadow and Long Meadow, they have an internal communication system, and one of their channels is Valley Eye Radio. Hmm. So then they can listen to us as well. So we're looking into other options as well, too, for what we can do to expand even further. There are other things we are currently in the works on, but we're very excited with what we're able to do because one of the saddest things that I've encountered in the last, in the time that I've been here at Valley Radio is two things. One, when people have not heard about us, I get people that when I tell them what I do or about Valley Eye Radio, and the reaction is, oh, if I had known about you, my mother or my grandmother or my friend would have loved this. Oh. And then the other one is when I have to, I had to X somebody off. And you get a number of people calling up, and there's the check marks, and there's the Xs, and that bothered me. Yeah. So now we're able to do more than we could before, and that is very, very nice. So uh, is there a charge for these radios, or are they free? No. Valley Radio, there is no charge for our service. We are a free service. Uh, in fact, we're one of six affiliates in what's known as MAIN, M-A-I-N, the Massachusetts Audio Information Network. We cover Hamden, Franklin, and Hampshire counties. We are a free service. There is no subscription fee. There's no annual fee. There's none of that. The radios themselves, when we do give out a radio to someone, we do request a donation of $65, okay. but it is a request. It's not a requirement. If someone is interested in giving a donation, but uh, 65 is a bit much, fine. They want to give us 20, that's fine. Hmm. Uh, true story, I was delivering a radio to a gentleman, and I explained about this, and I mentioned about all that. And he told me, he says, well, basically, I have nothing. And my response uh -huh. to him was, Here's your radio. Wow. We have a great relationship with Lions Clubs. I can't say enough about the various Lions Clubs in District 33Y. They have been enormously helpful to us. And one of the things that they've done is raise money for radios so that we don't have to turn away anybody. If anyone wants the radio, if they're in a position where they get a good enough signal and we'll give them the radio, and if they or a family member want to give that donation, great. Obviously, it certainly helps. We're not going to turn it away. Mm -hmm. But if they're in meager income or fixed income, 
Our main purpose is to get them that radio, to get them that service, to give them that connection so that they can listen to our programming. Yeah, that's how, how big a unit is it? Is it just a small box? It's a small unit, probably about six to eight inches wide and about okay. four or five inches tall. It just plugs into the wall? and Plugs into the wall or takes batteries. You extend the, the antenna out. You turn the knob. That's it. It's also the volume knob. So you just sounds like a large old fashioned transistor radio. Yeah, well, yeah, we have to think about it as well, too, because we're dealing with a lot of people that have some physical limitations or visual limitations. So the easier we can make it on people, the better off it is for everyone. How many total communities are you serving? Well, all of them in uh, those three counties. Uh, How many are there depends, obviously, or has depended upon. The radio reception so far okay so we're still working on that in many areas the website which is a brand new website uh the website we had before as i had mentioned to you i think before we went on the air that i would mention to somebody says have you seen our website and if they said yes my response to them was gee i'm really sorry for you <laughs> <laughs> it was a one pager that somebody did many many years ago and was very very limited let's be very kind about it and we'll phrase it that way however we were able to get a grant um might have been from the community foundation of western massachusetts um, which allowed us to develop a brand new fully accessible website so now it not only gives out the information to people so they can look up for themselves what our programming schedule is Mm -hmm. they can request the radio Mm -hmm. there they can make a donation which is obviously very nice or they could ask a question or request to be a volunteer. All that information is now on the website. We send out a monthly newsletter letting people know what we're doing, the kind of programming that we're doing, the special programming that we're doing. That's posted on the website. We have our blog, which we give them information about various kinds of events that we're involved in. So they can keep involved in what's going on with Valley Eye Radio much, much better than they ever could before. Yeah, that's really interesting. How many total listeners do you think you have? Unfortunately, we don't have that kind of information. We don't have Arbitron or we don't have Nielsen or any kind of service. And as I mentioned, traditionally we've given out radio. We've given out a number of radios over the years, but the issue is once that radio is out, we have no idea as far as how much they're being used. So it was always a limitation on that. With the website, we'll get more information on it, especially we hope to later... Uh, be able to have those kind of uh, metrics done and now we've also with the expansion out into the cable access and into Glen Meadow as I mentioned obviously the availability is much more than it ever was before Hmm. you know I'm going to uh, address this question to our producer and my associate producer they are not on a mic so if one of you can kind of give me a sense Some of, of it. I know that the Westwood Community Programming Channel, WCPC 15, is both Channel 12 and 15. Yes. Now, on 15, we're able to stream live off off the website, off the city. Can people, and I know that Valley Eye Radio is on Channel 12, if I'm not mistaken. You're correct. As of, as of right now, Channel 12 is only on Comcast Cable. But I have a directive from the mayor to make that streaming as well. So that's in the that's in the works to get built out. So we'll be people will be able to stream, stream live from channel twelve. Correct. Okay. Correct. But not yet. But not yet. Okay, that's good to know. So we'll be yeah. able to. I'm always interested in how can we expand our yeah. our broadcast oh, yeah. window in Westfield. We like to be what the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind Commissioner referred to as hyper local, which is that is our focus. So generally speaking, I mean, granted that things have changed in the last year or so with a lot of information needed on COVID and national news, but generally speaking, our focus is on the local news, the local community news. Mm -hmm. We figure that with national news, a lot of people, a lot of our listeners, they'll also listen to cable or they'll listen to other news sources. They can get the national news. What they're not getting largely is our programming the Westfield News, the Springfield Republican, the uh, you know various magazines that are very hard for them to do. Some of this you might be able to get online, some of the major magazines perhaps, but you're going to have to go online, you're going to have to navigate through all of the different um, screens and such, which is a bit of a challenge, especially if you're physically or visually right. impaired in some fashion. 
So this way, again, we try to make it as easy as possible. We read the basic articles from the various publications. They can find out on our schedule when that's coming up, and they can listen in. We're hoping in the future to be able to have podcasting as well, too, which will allow people to listen to the various programs when they want to listen to it, and that's another future advancement we're hoping to bring about. So when I when you look at your program schedule, so in Westfield, you know, you've got programs being read on during the morning and then mm-hmm. also in the evening and stuff. When people turn it on, there's there's gaps of dead air as well when there's no programming. Is that correct? Or that is, is there, that is, is there is, programming that is going 24-7? Programming is 24 7, 365. Wow. And so no matter when they turn it no on. No matter when they turn it on, they will hear programming. Most all of the programming is our own locally produced programming. It used to be years ago, and this is another improvement that has happened over the last few years. We had a system where I had a programming software that was not built for a radio station, honestly. Mm. It was built for a DJ. It had 10 slots, and when those 10 slots, unless I was there to keep feeding the slots with various other kinds of programming... That would be it. It would end. Hmm. So what happened is, as I mentioned, there are six affiliates in the main Massachusetts Audio Information Network. One of them is in South Boston in Marshfield called the Talking Information Center. So what would happen is when we weren't carrying our programming, we were carrying their programming. So they would be doing things like your Boston Globe and New York Times and so forth. We still carry some of their programming. We do carry the New York Times that they do. We do carry the Boston Globe. And in the morning, uh, during the week, we carry the Wall Street Journal. Hmm. But other than that, a good 85% or more of a given week, the entire seven days, is Valley Eye Radio locally produced programming. Hmm. Wow. I noticed on the outside wall, outside the studio, that there's... uh, a big rack with all different newspapers from yep. the community yep. and stuff. So that's yep. obviously you're getting those daily, I'm guessing, or no, it comes or? from different sources. Uh, the Springfield Republican is delivered to us. We are located here in Springfield. The issue had always been I wanted to really expand and fortify our coverage in other regions as well too, and it's kind of hard to do because they don't exactly deliver the Greenfield Recorder down to Springfield, Massachusetts. Yeah, okay, right. So we can't pick it up. So what we were doing is getting the information online. And I was doing a lot of clip and paste and such of various articles online in order to be able to do a particular programming. We've now expanded to the point where we can get the e-edition, the electronic edition online, and we can compose a file of articles that I send to a reader they read it, send it back to me. So we have readers all over the Pioneer Valley now who are able to, as I said, read from their own homes. Hmm. So that has allowed us to expand our programming as well, too. So now we cover pretty much everything that I'm aware of in the Pioneer Valley. There had been a time there were some publications that we still didn't have access to, but with all these new readers that came in, we were able to add them as well to our programming guide. So if there is a local publication, a community publication that is out there, we want to be able to provide it to our listeners. So I want to ask you this question. Mm-hmm. So let's take Westfield. We have the yep. Westfield News, which obviously right. you're reading. So on any given day, uh, just to give our, our viewers a sense of what it is, yep. and our listeners a sense of what it is they, they can expect, is a reader reading every article page by page, or are they just picking select articles? They're, you're not able to. I was always asked this question at times. Are you able to read the entire publication? <laughs> That's and, a lot of reading. And the answer is no, uh, right. we can't. Basically, the format that we look at, and many of our readers do pick their own articles based upon certain guidelines. General rule, most every publication that is out there, the front page has what they consider to be their most prominent stories. Sure. So you're reading the front page stories. And then you're working your way through the publication, generally focusing in again on the local news. There might be a national story. Well, we'll hold off. If we have extra time or something, we can throw that in. State news, well, if it relates to what's going on here, state talking about the 
cannabis control commissioner and right. such. Well, that decision might be in Boston, but that's going to affect Westfield. That's going to affect all the communities in the Pioneer Valley. Right. So there's a local connection to it. But again, the national news, as I mentioned, people usually get that from another source. So we tried to do that. If we can throw in a little local sports, that's good as well, too. Um, we only do the national sports generally during the Springfield Republican broadcast. Mm -hmm. But when we're doing the Westfield News, we'll read uh, Putz's column. And oh, such. sure. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah. We read uh, Hints from Heloise and Dear oh, yeah. Annie. Yeah. Right. And all that as well, too, to give a kind of a broad perspective. The general idea is that I want the listeners to be able to get the sense that if they had the newspaper, they're flipping through it and they're reading the local information all the way to the end. And that's generally how we structure the program. There are some cases, unfortunately, we're not always able to read a publication, especially a lot of the community publications, on the day that they come out. Mm. So it is possible that they might have a story that relates to an event which will already have happened Got by it. the time our broadcast happens. Right. We can usually still read those articles. We just have to change the tense. Okay. So instead of saying that uh, Mayor Hummison is doing the penguin plunge on this Saturday, plunge, right. we would say Mayor Hummison did the penguin plunge, right. Right. assuming that it actually happened as was described right. in the Westfield News or another okay. publication. So we try to get as much information as we can out to the yeah, people. Interesting. So let's talk about the volunteers for a moment. Yes. Um, before January 2020 and before COVID hit, mm -hmm. you were you said you were about 40 volunteers? 40 so? or so, give or take, okay. yeah. And then as soon as we're now starting to look at this pandemic and everybody's holed in, yeah. all of a sudden you put this cry out for volunteers and it just explodes and you're 90 to 100 now? We're over 100 now, actually, that, that, are, that are listed. Not everyone is active at the moment. Okay. As I mentioned, that number includes a lot of volunteers that had to go, I called it in reserve, if you will. We still consider them part of the family, and I do refer to it as the volunteer reader family. I love it. Okay. In fact, when somebody comes in to become a volunteer, usually we would have them come in. We'd have them do a test read. Obviously, we want to make sure that yeah, I was gonna ask they can read that, fairly right? well. Um, I, another one of my expressions is I like to say, the best way to read is not to. And the reason I mean that is I could say, and today in the news there is this happening and that happening and this happening. I'm reading, but I don't know if anybody would particularly would want to listen to right. me doing that. So we look for this conversational style. We look for, as I say, real people talking with real people. So they introduce themselves, and they put a little bit of their personality into it, and they're reading the articles from the publication to try to be a little bit uh, animated, if you will, and to make it an enjoyable listen for the listeners. And how long will is a is a listening session or or a reading session? Most of our programs tend to be a half an hour in length, except okay. for the major publications. The Springfield Republican is an hour and a half. The Westfield News is a half hour. The Daily Hampshire Gazette and Greenfield Recorder are an hour each. Most other programs are half an hour. We have some specialty programs. As I mentioned, we were going out and doing these special feature recordings. Mm -hmm. On Saturdays at 3.30 in the afternoon, we have what we call our local event program. This had been a program where if I would go out to, let's say, one of the Westfield 350 events, and I would do a recording there, that is generally when that program would be played. Since COVID hit, we've only done one interview since then, most all of our feature programming now is sent to us as the audio from a Zoom recording that a uh, stores library in Long Meadow may have done or the Long okay. Meadow sure. uh, Adult Center may have done. Some very interesting, fascinating programs that we're able to get the audio from and then incorporate that into our programming as well, too. Is there a need for more volunteers? I am always looking for volunteers. <laughs> Spoken like a true nonprofit person. I am always looking for oh. volunteers for a number of reasons. Uh, we have volunteers that do everything from just a few literal articles a week, not an actual program. Because even though I said the programs can be a half an hour in length, not all the programs fill the full half hour. So if someone does a program that runs about 22 minutes, I've got to fill the other eight minutes with something. Right. 
So we go out and we get articles from National Geographic, New York Times, various other sources, and we have people read specific articles. There's one thing we have called Scamicide, which is an actual blog post, scamicide.com. And the uh, gentleman who writes it is a local attorney. We interviewed him as one of our programs, and he gave us permission to read his scam of the day. Because mm. there's a lot of scams that affect not only right. seniors, but everyone. Right. So we get his daily scam of the day, and I copy it down, send a file to a reader. He, they, he or she reads it and sends it back to us. And we have that as part of our programming as well, too. We have a Vet Minute program, a veteran outreach, where a veteran himself reads various publications from military.com oh and various gosh. newsletters. Yeah. And that's seven days a week at 2.30 in the afternoon. Well, that only lasts maybe 10 minutes. So now I've got to fill the other 20. So people do just simple articles. Other people do full programs. I have a number of readers, thank God, who do multiple programs because when a lot of people weren't able to do their programming anymore, mm. we still needed to keep it going. So I'm very happy to say that we have not had to cut back on our programming since all of this happened. As I mentioned, we have expanded it instead. So if a person wants to volunteer, how do they get in touch with you? They can email me. My email address is Harold, H-A-R-O-L-D, at valleyiradio.org. They can give us a call. It's 413 413- 747-7337, or they could request to be a volunteer through our website. And as I said, we're looking, always looking for volunteers because in addition to doing that or filling a need for a particular programming, a number of our publications that we do, we added because one of the readers said, well, I get this publication. Really? Oh, that sounds like something that would be very interesting to have. So then we add it to our programming as well, too. The interesting thing, what I am a very strong believer in, and I tell this to our readers, is that I believe that if you're reading something that you're already subscribed to or you already are reading, chances are you're interested in that yourself, and that's mm-hmm. going to come through in your reading. Mm-hmm. If you're a big sports fan and I have you read Sports Illustrated, our listeners are going to know that you like sports. If you hate sports, and I have you read Sports Illustrated, our listeners are going to know that you're not exactly into what you're reading. Right. Right. So to try to get that involvement, I really believe in that. So we have people reading various publications, but I'm always looking for fill-in readers, readers who might be able to be, let's say, who live in Westfield. I have readers right now who are reading the Westfield News, but what if they go on vacation? Right. What if they take a Saturday off or they have to have an appointment? I've got to find a substitute for that. In many cases, that substitute is oh, I see. yours truly. Right. But if I have another reader who tells me that, yeah, I get the Westfield News, or yeah, I, I live in Greenfield and I could read the Greenfield Recorder, uh, or I get the New York Times or whatever, that's good to know because that way when we need to go full remote like we did those couple weeks we were transitioning to our new studios, I can then contact someone and say, hey, I need someone to read this publication. Are you available? Mm -hmm. And they'd be able to say yes. Now, people do not have to have any broadcasting experience or any experience at all. It's just a desire to want to help others. A desire to want to help. We have very few people here that would be considered professional readers, which is fine. Because, again, we're looking for that personal contact, that conversation between a friend and another friend. And if that comes through, where the person can modulate their voice well enough, they keep up a fairly good, what I call the Goldilocks zone kind of a pace. It's not too fast, not too slow. And I'll work with somebody to do it. Uh, Usually when somebody contacts me, Most everybody has been really, really good. Occasionally, you, I might get somebody who needs to work on something, and I will, I will not say sorry, forget it, (laughs) too bad, you're no good, go away. No, 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 because I don't believe that. I will work with someone, and I will say, okay, I listen to this. Gee, maybe you could work on this. We can do this and do another test recording. We'll see. I won't give up on somebody. Hmm. If somebody decides that it's not for them, okay, that's fine. But I will work with them. If someone wants to record from home and you say, well, record from home, gee, that sounds pretty complicated. <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's really very easy. Right. 
People do it on their own computer at home. The recording software is free. Hmm. If you have a PC, it's a program we use called Audacity. If you have a Mac, we found out that when they upgraded their operating system some time ago, it doesn't play very well with Audacity anymore. But there is a program called Easy Audio Recorder that I've used myself that they can do their recordings using a Mac. The microphone, however, that somebody usually would have to get for themselves because the microphones that are attached to the computers, generally the track record has not been very good with quality on that. Mm -hmm. The microphone that we have been using is generally this simple microphone. It comes with its own little tripod and a foam ball like we have here on our, radio, our microphones and costs about 22, 25 bucks. You plug it into your USB port and you open up the software and you go for it. And I have gone over the phone with someone step by step and say, okay, you've got Audacity up there. Okay, now you look over here on that part of the screen or something, you see that? And then I will walk them through it Okay. and help them out. So very easy to deal with, <laughs> I try to be. And because I know that people, the volunteers are who we are. And I really value our volunteer family. And oh, just one other thing about using that family is that when they come in to do their test read, or now they're doing a remote test read, they do it at home. If the test read works out well enough, and I believe it's you know something that we can work with, I don't ask them, okay, would you like to be a volunteer? I say, may we adopt you? Seriously. And I send them the adoption papers, otherwise known as the volunteer information <laughs> sheet, because I really do believe that it is, right. they are part of our family now. Yeah. And even if I they're not able to do, family, right? even if they're not able to do their recordings because they have to stay home, they have to protect their loved ones and themselves or such, that's fine. They're still part of the family. Yeah. That's just amazing. You know, I want to encourage our listeners, our viewers, uh, our seniors, or anybody else in Westfield, if you're really looking for a fun way to get involved and do something meaningful, definitely reach out to Valley Eye Radio and talk to Harold. Uh, I think this would be a great outlet for you and a way to really provide important programming services to our community. I, I think that's yeah. wonderful. Can you just go over one more time the email address and your phone number? Certainly. I can be reached at Harold, H-A-R-O-L-D, at valleyiradio.org. The phone number is 413-747-7337, or they can contact us through our website, which is valleyiradio.org. We are also on Facebook and Instagram. I do not tweet. <laughs> And so they could send me a message through Facebook, which some people have done. Yeah, that's fantastic. And being a nonprofit, um, I'm guessing that you're working on a very small um, budget. Yeah. So you're looking yeah. for donations. People yeah, can donate, and those are tax deductible if they apply. Um, if they apply to the person, uh, right. they'd have to check with their tax uh, professional on that. But right. uh, any kind of a donation is certainly very much appreciated because... We'd have very few people that are paid staff here. Right. Most everybody is a volunteer. And it does help because funding can be an issue. It was an issue a few years ago when the state, there was a lot of reasons for that. We were not able to get funding from the state, which amounted to about half of our budget at the mm. time. So it was really tough there for a while. But again, thanks to the Lions Club and thanks to grants and the Community Foundation, the Sarah Gillett um, Services for the Elderly. Yeah. They've been wonderful to us over the years in supporting us. Thanks to them and the donations from listeners and from family members and people who just like what we're doing. Uh, we made it through. And now, although we are getting some State funding, it is through the earmark process, which means we're not actually in somebody's budget, but we're hoping to be able to remedy that sometime in the future. Yeah, fantastic. And I do just want to give a quick shout out to your executive director, uh, Barbara Lowe, mm -hmm. uh, who's doing a great job. And oh, yeah. just uh, two of you, three of you that are here? Um, basically, I mean, my, myself, who is the uh, program coordinator, Barbara, who is our executive director. We have a part-time assistant, uh, administrative assistant, I call her our ace administrative assistant, Mary right. Zajac, and uh, she's been a great big help as well, right. too. But that's it. 
Yeah, amazing and what you're doing here. we have to pull the whole things together with the help of all yeah. our volunteers. Volunteers, yeah. Well, the strength of any nonprofit is certainly their volunteers oh, yes. for sure. Uh, as we start to wrap up here, is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you would like to mention? Well, just the fact that what we're trying to do is something that's fairly unique, that is unique. Uh, someone described us one time that there is such a thing as books on tape. They looked at us as newspapers on tape. Okay. But we do even more than that. And we are always looking for ideas. We're always looking for different kinds of programming that we can offer to our listeners to try to make their lives a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And we l appreciate the help of a lot of people that have brought us here to where we are now. And we just need help from people to get the word out, let people know about Valley Eye Radio. Mm -hmm. That's probably the biggest thing. Unfortunately, with everything that's happened with COVID, a lot of our outreach efforts have been curtailed a bit. We used to go out, I used to go out and do presentations at various organizations, and I'd be able to go out and get the word out and talk to various groups. I wasn't able to do that because the groups weren't meeting anymore. So hopefully, maybe we'll be able to do that again. But if you're with a particular group, mention it to your group. Uh, if there's something that they might be involved in or want to be involved in. Uh, if you know of someone that could use our service who has some sort of a need for accessible programming, contact us, let us know, get the word out so that I don't have to hear again from someone, gee, if we only knew <laughs> about your service, this right. person would have loved it because that is something we're trying to do. Yeah. Well, I do have a gift for you. Uh, as you well know, I was the head of the Westfield 350, and one of the things that I'm most in, and uh, most proud of, and Ken Stomsky, who's our associate producer here, was also on our committee. Um, he headed up all of our media and our website. But we produced two books. One is a, and I'm thinking, I'm, am I getting this, Ken? Um, this, this is the Westfield history book. Uh, we wanted to really try to capture kind of an overview of all of the history of Westfield from 1669. I'm going to uh, give that to you. Thank you. And then also uh, we have a second book that we produced that really captures the essence of the year-long celebration that yeah. we did with everything from the parades to fireworks to lecture series that I know you came over to Westfield for. Yes. Uh, children's carnivals yes. and everything else. I want to give that to you because I got thinking about it. I said, there's some great... <laughs> There's some great yeah. articles and stories in these books, Very and nice. so to mix it up a little bit, mm -hmm. some of your readers might be interested that are specifically focused on Westfield, uh, capturing some so, of the so, stories that are in so there. So now I can get over the disappointment that I, <laughs> my raffle ticket wasn't picked <laughs> at right. those uh, presentations that I went oh, to. Oh, <laughs> those raffle tickets, they were a hot commodity, that's for sure. Well, I do want to say thanks to my guest, Harold Anderson, well, who's you. the uh, programming coordinator here at Valley Eye Radio. Uh, your passion and your dedication to this work, uh, it really comes through loud and clear. And I just love in nonprofit work that usually the work that we're doing in nonprofits, and I've been in nonprofits my entire yeah. life, um, you do this because you choose to. Uh, you want to make a difference, you want to give back, and you want to really help the quality of life within your community. So I want to applaud you yeah. and Barbara, uh, Barbara Lowe, the executive yeah. director here, and all of your volunteers uh, for everything that you do. So just kudos to you. So on behalf of Pete Coles, our producer, and Kenny Stomsky, our associate producer, I am Harry Rock. You've been listening to another exciting edition of Westfield Council on Aging Presents. We have been at Valley Eye Radio here at 1 Federal Street in Building 101 in Springfield. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you on the next show.